Hi everyone, I'm here with my friend Chow Jay Gonzalez. He's a teacher in CPS, Chicago Public Schools, where we both grew up and went to school. So Chow Jay, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Hey yo, what's up guys? I'm Chow Jay. It's Chow like chow mein noodles and Jay like a blue jay. There's a lot of history behind why I do that when I introduce myself, but we'll get into that later. I'm half Chinese and half Mexican. Currently a fourth grade TAT, temporary assigned teacher for Swift Elementary School and CPS. But luckily I have another position of the next year, but that's what I'm doing right now. And I'm loving it. I'm so glad I went into this career. I think it's a good fit for me. I think yeah. I started reaching out to you because I saw that you were a teacher. And I just was like, wait, I had no idea you were a teacher. I didn't know how long you were doing it. And this was your first year. So I'm glad that you had a really great first year of teaching. But just to give some background of how we know each other, we started going to Chinese school at the same school, but we weren't in the same grade level in Chinese school. But I remember seeing Chow Jay around. And then we went to the same high school together, Northside College Prep. And that's how we actually formally met each other through like mutual friends. Beyond Chinese school, what was your exposure to Chinese culture growing up? I'm super sheltered. I've only been to one other country in my entire life, and that's Canada. It doesn't even count because it was Niagara Falls. <laughs> Niagara Falls is like half based in the United States. Growing up, my parents, both my dad and my mom, weren't really infused with their culture. Like they didn't really, they were not really in touch with their their culture as much. For example, my grandparents died. My grandpa died last year and my grandma died two years ago. And when my grandma died, we had no idea how to host a traditional Chinese funeral. Our family, my mom's side of the family is not that in touch with their roots, their cultural roots. So we had to like do a lot of research and ask people. So that's just an example. Like we're not that traditional, but there are like Chinese values and philosophies that she embodies. Mom was born in the States. Yep. Okay. So it was your grandparents on your mom's side who came to the United States. Yeah. Okay. They, they all came together. Pretty much they're all survivors of the Cambodian genocide and so they chose to come to the states after because they were like flying um, the refugees off into whatever country. But my grandpa told, I once told us that he wanted to pick France instead of the U.S. And honestly, it probably wouldn't have been a bad choice. Yeah, that would be awesome. French right now. <laughs> <laughs> Or probably I wouldn't even exist right now. On your dad's side, like what exposure he gave you or his family gave you to the Mexican culture? Before I answer that, why I answer a question. Which side of my family do you think is bigger, the Mexican side or the Chinese side? Okay, so from stereotypes, I would want to say the Mexican side, but I feel like Chinese families can get pretty big too. People are always surprised when I tell them this, but like I have one cousin on my Mexican side and that's it. Like I have one, I have four aunts and uncles on my dad's side, my Mexican side, but only one of them has kids. And then on my Chinese side, I have 25 cousins. <laughs> like my mom my mom has six brothers and sisters and they all have three or more kids yeah my my chinese side is definitely bigger since your mexican family is smaller uh -huh. does that explain i guess like less exposure to mexican culture yeah definitely i definitely identify more as asian and that has a big role to play in it like i have one cousin growing up like no one to play with on my dad's side everyone on my mom's side is here in chicagoland area so we had so many like, birthday parties like every single week my friends would make fun of me like, like another birthday party Saturday. And, like, like, yeah. So how yeah. did your parents meet then? My parents met in college. They went to NEIU in Chicago. So you said that you identify as like being more Asian. Is that because of how you were raised or is that because of how people like treated you? Did you just gravitate more towards like Asian friends? Like, what do you mean by that? It's definitely, so the first most important factor is because the people I was surrounded with were mostly Asian. Like my family, yeah, I would just spend a lot of time with my cousins and they're all Asian. So that was a big part of it. And then like in middle school, high school, when I was starting to like try to develop an identity for myself as a teenager. Like, I found comfort in hanging out with other Asians who watched anime and played video games, you know? So I was like, yeah, these are my people. That's how like I started solidifying my identity. When was it like clear to you that other people yeah. were that's a good question. So really early on, because of my name, honestly, it was like branding me on the head. I am Asian, right? Chow, Chow J. Something so distinct as Chow J Gonzalez, right? Like first and lastly, uh -huh. one Asian, one Hispanic or Latino. Yeah, my teachers would be taking attendance. I hear a three second pause. I'm like, that's me. <laughs> every <laughs> single, every single year, right? So I was super aware that I was different Asian pretty early on kindergarten or first grade and then however I feel like that developed more in like middle school or high school when I started consuming Asian media anime studio Ghibli films video games a lot of Asian stuff and then I realized 
wow, no one else watches this stuff. No one else likes this stuff, except for a few Asians in my class. But then I became increasingly aware, yeah, I'm, I'm Asian. Chow J would be like the American pronunciation. Of That's the like American Jie. pronunciation. Yeah. yeah, Chow J is the more like, authentic Chinese Yeah, I can't pinpoint any moments in my life where I've been given like a derogatory twist to my name, but I did feel, feel self-conscious about my name just because it would take people's time and like energy to remember. So I felt like I wish I had a normal name so they wouldn't have a hard time remembering my name. It was just that. I've gotten Kauji, but they're all like mispronunciations. They weren't like intentionally trying to hurt my feelings. Right. I've gotten uh, Coyote. <laughs> 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 my my so <laughs> soccer coach, my soccer coach would call me Chayote, so I'd be like r sprinting down the field because I was a I was a forward. Like Coyote and then Chayote. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. So I'd be sprinting down the field, and he'd be like Chayote, get the ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, so now as a teacher, I guess you go by Mr. Gonzalez, but you know, kids are mm -hmm. curious about like first names and I know my students want to try to figure out how to pronounce my first name. So have you had that conversation with your students about your name and where it comes from and your background and all that stuff? So none of them know how to say my first name yet. And it's because I have never told them and I'm refusing to tell them just because I want to get on their nerves. It's not because yeah. I'm embarrassed about my first name or anything like that. Yeah. It's just like, I like concealing it. They get more frustrated. And that's one to me. I'm gonna tell them when I leave at the end of the year how to say my first name. They're they like, what are you, right? That's one of their first questions. They knew I was Asian because they think uh, I thought I love Filipino. They didn't really say much when I said I was Chinese or Mexican. They're just like, oh, cool. <laughs> And I think yeah. that's, you know, the beauty of growing up in Chicago, that that's not real. Like, oh my gosh, you know? Yeah, yeah. So was that also like a common question to you growing up as well? The what are you, where are you from? Or did you not really get that? Honestly, I get that more now since I'm dating. <laughs> it's like one of the first questions I get, like, what, where, what are you? Not, not as much as I would expect, honestly, growing up, but I did get it. I definitely did get it. Yeah. So with your students, in what ways have you, besides, you know, answering the question about like, what are you, what is your background? What ways have you introduced anything that from either of the two cultures into classroom? We talked about Lunar New Year. I actually was using Chinese New Year and Lunar New Year interchangeably until this year. One of my coworkers is Korean and she texted me because she's the art teacher. And then she heard some of the students refer to it as Chinese New Year. She's like, you should probably use Lunar New Year to refer to it because other Asian countries besides China celebrate it too, right? Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's a good point. We did stuff for Lunar New Year. One of my activities for Lunar New Year, New Year celebration was to have kids guess the order of the 12 zodiac animals in the great race. You know, rat came first, cow came second, tiger came third, but they had to guess it without hearing the story first. So it was just completely random. Most of them are probably gonna guess like, okay, tiger comes first or dragon comes first place. Easy, right? But it's, it's not. It's not that. So I was not expecting any student to get the right orders. 12, right? So the probability of that is really low. One student actually did. Perfectly. Did. Yeah, perfect. I was like, what in the <laughs> world, man? I was, my mind was blown. I was freaked out because, and he was, we were all interrogating and we, we checked his history too, his search history. We made him share his screen. And then we checked his search history to see if like he Googled the animals or anything like that. Yeah. Nothing. It was just out of, straight out of his brain. It was wild. That's impressive. We did some kind of uh, activity where we were looking at a class from the Philippines. And then one of my students was like, oh, you look like that guy, Mr. Gonzalez. Or like sometimes one of my students would be like, oh, you look like BTS. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> it's because like, it's the, it's the only Asians they're like exposed to, right? So exactly. They, they draw parallels right away. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as like, you're a biracial person, so I think yeah. you go either way. So I've gotten uh, Filipino the most, that's number one. Well, I can't, I can't disagree there, I, I look Filipino. I've gotten Indian sometimes, I've gotten Puerto Rican, Korean I've gotten sometimes. Yeah, but yeah, I've gotten mistaken for a lot of races. And I, I don't mind. It's. I mean, I think it's kind of cool that people like to associate with you and think you're like of different backgrounds. You're almost like a chameleon of sorts. Yeah, that's a pretty positive way to, to look at it. I mean, you could also look at it negatively. Like a, a lot of people won't accept you. Well, with, with a more conservative traditional group, a lot of them might have a harder time accepting you because you're not full. You're not a pure breed. Or right? I've experienced some of that. Yeah, can you tell me more about that? It might not even be that they really think that it might just be me projecting my my inner feelings onto like insecurities what, uh, obviously i knew i was different from them early on because i looked different and we were the only we're the only ones in the family that are mixed now that i'm looking at it, we never experienced direct racism from any of my family members they never pointed out anything like hey you look different from us they never really said that but it's just the little thing the little things that kind of piled up and like for example if, if they would treat us mean or said mean something mean to us we'd automatically attribute that to 
because we're not full Asian. They're treating us that way because we're not full Chinese. And that's just, I mean, personally, that's just my, probably my brain not making it seem like that. But yeah, it's just that insecurity of being different that kind of like made that all happen. We went to Chinese school, but I mean, I didn't learn Chinese from Chinese school, but I'm going to be real. Wasted my mom, my parents' money for like eight years. I feel so bad now. Like back then I hated it. I was like, I don't want to be here. Oh, I don't want to yeah. play video games. I don't want to spend my Saturdays at school. I mean, I hate it, but at the same time, I kind of liked it because I got to see my cousins and hang out with some friends there. Yeah, I was like the class clown. I treated the teachers so badly. Like, I always goofed off in class. And it's funny because I was an angel in American school. Yeah, um, I'm but, like, like in Chinese. It's so hard to imagine because at least yeah. from high school, your reputation was that you were like softer spoken and, you know, like you were a musician. And so, like, you were charismatic in that way. Yeah. Definitely not <laughs> in, like a class clown acting up kind of way that you're just like, yeah. I think it's because I felt I I think it's because I felt really comfortable there. Like I had my family there, right? I was really familiar with them, right? It was I wasn't as awkward, socially awkward because I was comfortable. That enabled me to let out some of my troll, my troll side. <laughs> Looking back, I re really regret it. Like that was an awesome chance to learn Chinese. I took Spanish in high school, so I can speak that very poorly, but enough to convey ideas to some of my students that only speak Spanish. I don't speak any other language fluently. There is kind of that divide in the Asian community of do you hang out with Asians or do you hang out with white people or yeah. other multiculturals? Because Asians socially have the option to be part of the white people. It's just like how it is. White people are more accepting towards, well, at least racist white people are more accepting towards Asian people because they see them as a model minority. Right. They're like, oh yeah, you can you can stand on the same stage with us, right? And Asians like that invitation because white people are socially speaking Seemingly. high status. Well, on the yeah. outside, you know, on the surface level are Right, on the surface them. level. But then internally, if we have the issues that we have, if people don't address the inherent issues in that model minority stereotype, then they're kind of negating the fact that Asians, at least like for politics and in media, not until recent times, haven't really been given much of focus or a platform. The college course that I took, it was like my senior year that kind of went into Asian American history. Mm -hmm. Talked about the fact that the model minority stereotype comes from the whole idea of elevating a minority group, but to make them feel like they have a little bit of power over the other minorities so that it kind of breeds like a internal a divide. Yeah. The group. So it's not like all people of color are banded together and have this common purpose against the yeah. party. It's kind of like, well, you're a little bit better. So here's a little bit of power, a little bit of esteem, a little bit yeah. of wealth that will give get you on their side. Right, to make you feel yeah. like you're in a better position, but really it, the main issue still stands that there's not uh, representation. I think yeah. when Andrew Yang ran as president, you know, people uh, know him as like the Chinese candidate. That was the first time that I know of that an Asian American has tried to run for presidency and has gotten to a certain level of popularity that people started knowing about him. But he was even saying that bigger networks weren't giving him coverage the way that they were giving other candidates coverage. To be honest, our history of discrimination, the reason that it's important that it's taught in schools is so that we can see that there's more commonalities. When I teach Asian history to my students, I relate it to the border crisis because there were like Japanese internment camps. So um, I never learned about that and all yeah, that. Yeah, and like, completely skipped over it. Not everyone finds out that history. Like I didn't start learning more about it until I started looking into how I could teach it to my students. And then of course there was like mass mob killing of Chinese people in Chinatown and stuff like that. Similar to like race riots in Tulsa and in other cities across America. When I do teach this history, just to make it more relatable to my students, I connect it to history of like their people or their background just mm -hmm. to show like we have more in common than maybe you think or maybe you've been made to believe because of politics or rhetoric in the media and of course always during times of economic uncertainty or war does this racist rhetoric come up every time that there is insecurity about another country's dominance yeah. Or, yeah. or with another country is when like that language is banned. People of that background are ostracized or viewed suspiciously of whose side are you on? Yeah, it's because that prejudice is kind of always there. It's kind of looming in the background. And then that those events kind of like trigger or, or give, give rise to that rhetoric, like you said. I know that Illinois is talking about mandating teaching Asian American history in the 2022-2023 mm -hmm. school year. What is your opinion of that? Do you think that's important? Do you think that's not necessary? Let me ask you a question. 
question first. Do you know if it's mandated to teach about black history in schools right now? I'm curious if it is. Yeah, I don't know if it is. So if it's not, that's pretty interesting that they would enforce this Asian one too, because black history is just as important, right? Oh yeah, for um, sure. Some of my students earlier in the year were like, why does the school I teach at teach about black history? And I was like, that's a great question. And you know what? I'm planning on spending the whole month of black history month teaching about it. Like just that shows how important it is to the students to learn about their, their histories, right? Oh yeah, so, they're asking for it. Yeah, of course I would be in favor of that. I think it would be great to make it a, a law so that more schools are held accountable. And of course yeah. there's gonna be pushback from people who don't see it as necessary. Some Asians themselves are not in support of this law because they see it as being racist. The government mandating that a certain people's history is being taught. Even talking about the model minority stereotype is considered to be buying into the victim narrative. They don't want to buy into the identity politics because they don't want to talk about their race all the time. I don't get that. Like that, that's the same thing as like talking about transgenderism in class. How is that bad? How is that a negative thing you're just educating the students about? You're not telling them to take one side or the other. You don't have to support transgenderism. I'm just telling you that they exist. There are transgender Especially exactly. with our role as like educating young people to make better decisions. So yeah, it's like, sure. how could we not equip them with this information? Crazy how late some of us have learned this history and how once we learn it, it's kind of life changing because it's yeah. like, what? Like that happened? Like there was a Chinese Exclusion Act that limited the number of Chinese people who could come, even though they just helped build the railroads. This is so important because I've ever seen the TED Talk, The Danger of a Single Story. The thing about stereotypes, and why they're so dangerous is because it's one story. It's one story and then it completely affects how you view a certain group of people just based on that one story. But when you educate people about groups of people, other groups of people, you're feeding them multiple stories, more experiences so that they can gain a better understanding of that group of people and make better judgments about them. I think that's so important. I, and I think the root of all like conflict and hatred and violence in the world is a lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. We just don't understand the other side enough. And if you're not teaching them, people, the public, about these different cultural backgrounds and their histories and all that stuff, then you're depriving them of having an accurate understanding of these different people. I think it's yeah. more of like the shared history as Americans. Like first off, even white Americans are immigrants, right? Like European Americans yeah. are immigrants, but for whatever reason, sometimes it's seen as like, those are the majority, those are true Americans, like white Americans. <laughs> Let's look at the history books again, like Native yeah. Americans. We're here. It's so important to educate people that because it's never good to just have one story about a group of people. It's awesome that like high chews and different snacks like food and media, pop culture is a way that our students are getting a better understanding of Asian culture, but that doesn't mean that there's enough education about yeah. our history and about yeah. the struggle of Asian Americans. I feel like a lot of times within the Asian culture, it's like, you know, don't talk about it. Don't draw attention to it. Let's just work mm -hmm. hard and people will recognize that we're good enough. But it's like, no, we should talk about it. And yeah. But we should stand up for the injustices. That's like the issue with the term, the colorblind term, right? That's not good to be colorblind. We should see our differences and we should acknowledge them and we should learn about them. We should talk about them. Being colorblind means you're turning a blind eye to all these problems in society. Well, thank you so much, Jay, for having this conversation with me, taking your time, sharing your story, sharing your opinions about the state of American society. I hope that we can do this again. Bye. I know. Thank you. Anytime. Peace out. <laughs>